agriculture and development economist and currently leading mathematics as climate change practice at the enterprise level. And a uh, uh, big warning today for me, it's an important conversation about measuring resilience. All of us in the audience, uh, as we're getting deeper into the winter, I'm sure the memories of uh, summer full of extreme events have not faded. Certainly the COP would focus on it. The 26 conference of parties uh, was initiating a call for filling the adaptation finance gap. And the one strand of doubt that I kept hearing since that COP26 was that, what is climate adaptation? How are we going to measure our success? And so the question before us today for this panel is whether measurement of climate resilience is potentially a barrier for attracting more finance. On the mitigation side, you have GHG, greenhouse gas emissions reduction as a very clear specific indicator. And at the same time, even if we recognize that we're falling short in raising adaptation finance, in comparison to the goal, we have to recognize that the pledges have been made. Uh, an additional 230 million has been pledged to the adaptation fund at COP27, the recent one. And donors across the board, Rockefeller, Gates Foundation, are investing in climate adaptation. USAID alone hopes to make 500 million people more climate resilient. So the question therefore is definitely whether we can defensively measure the impact of these investments. Are we making people more climate resilient? And how are we defining that? Do we agree on that? And the May convening uh, uh, last, this particular year, uh, advanced this conversation was led by University of Arizona and USAID and uh, and I think a big part of that community is present here today, and those conversations were really valuable. And for Mathematica, you know, as some of you may know, founded on by Princeton mathematicians to bring highest quality of rigor to policy making, we are get, engaging in this idea of measurement. We are conducting several evaluations of programs that are expected to improve resilience. In fact, we're in the midst of providing learning advice to the Alliance for Green Revolution of Africa on how to measure resilience. There, Top line goal is to improve farmers' resilience across multiple African countries. We have also developed a prototype resilience platform to support locally led development. And, and one of the features of the platform has to be to report on climate resilience. So naturally, we set about reviewing the evidence, um, the ideal indicator, uh, and got very curious and, and thought we should have a conversation around it. It's also supported by our recent, we recently joined Adaptation Research Alliance, which is a global collaborative focused on action-oriented research to improve evidence on adaptation. Uh, and so this uh, engagement also uh, supports that uh, piece of work. So our review of literature suggests that in many definitions and many metrics, resilience as a capacity, resilience as a return to equilibrium, resilience as a normative condition. And we'll delve into all of this in the course of the conversation today. And the literature also suggests that we have to solve for differences that arise when you are assessing resilience in the context of climate change, uh, when some of the um, shocks are sort of long burn, slow burn event, uh, you know, rising temperatures. Um, and a lot of the literature has come from the humanitarian assistance community where they're dealing with very immediate shocks, uh, short term shocks. So we'll delve into that today too. So let's get into this important conversation. Uh, just a reminder to the audience that today for the first hour, we'll have a panel conversation. You get a lot out of it. I encourage you to stay on for the round table where we will bring in more experts on resilience. John Meyer from USAID, uh, Center for Resilience. Tim franklin Bugger of Tanko International worked a lot on resilience as a capacity. Lindsay Jones of Global Crisis Risk Platform from the World Bank, uh, who's worked a lot on subjective measures of resilience. Hope Nicholson of University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign worked a lot on well-being-based measures. Fernanda Zermoglio of USAID, Climate Adaptation and Resilience Advisor. Greg Collins, Associate Vice President of Resilience and International Development at the University of Arizona, also the previous head of Center of Resilience at USAID. And Mo Alash of Hamilton College, uh, his co-authored the paper that Michael will speak about. So please do try and stay on for that conversation where we really try and advance the conversation and dig deeper. So let me start the panel conversation, and I will start. Would like to start with USAID, um, uh, with, uh, inviting both Dr. Catherine Pomposi and Nathan Ives to um, talk a little bit about what USAID is doing in climate adaptation and where they are in measurement. So Catherine Pomposi serves as a climate adaptation metrics advisor within USAID's Bureau of Resilience, 
and food security. In this role, Catherine broadly supports climate adaptation programming, reporting of adaptation results, and other adaptation metrics and analytics work. She's trained climate scientists with expertise in understanding aspects of climate variability and change in semi-arid and monsoon regions. She holds a PhD in the climate science from Columbia University. Nate serves as a resilience metrics advisor within the USA's Bureau of Resilience and Food Security. In this role, he helps develop the resilience metrics and indicators, as well as some of Bureau's impact evaluations. He has a cross-sectoral background in impact evaluation, benefit for analysis, and research focused on resilience wash, gender, and agriculture. Prior to joining a, uh, USA, Nate was with the was a Cambodia country director for causal design uh, and a research impact and impact evaluation firm, uh, and holds a degree and master's degree in international economics from John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. So, Catherine, if you would like to talk and say a little bit about what USAID is doing in the climate adaptation space, how you're measuring it, and then we can go to Nate. I find it really interesting that as we are trying to have a conversation about climate measure, uh, climate uh, resilience measurement and resilience metrics, that both of you are sort of almost showing that uh, two different distinct areas that sit in USAID and how we're trying to bring that together. So over to you, Catherine. Yeah, thank you so much, Talika, for the kind introduction. And I'll go ahead and just say thank you on behalf of Nate and myself for the opportunity to speak today and certainly um, learn a lot from the other panelists and participants. Um, so I'll just kick it off. I think many here attending will know that in the last few years, in particular, we've really been transitioning to an inclusive whole of agency approach to addressing climate change. And this is really evidenced by several recent high profile announcements and commitments, some of which have already been mentioned, many of which are outlined in a recent USAID climate strategy, the prepare initiative and, and many other things that I'm sure participants here have seen floating around. Um, as the agency continues to fund and support a myriad of climate projects, whether these are in early warning systems, renewable energy projects, agriculture investments, etc. We're really interested in evaluating and learning from our approaches and work and, and the work of um, partner organizations. Monitoring and evaluation of USAID climate and certainly our development programs are of course key to our accountability and learning. And we do utilize standard performance metrics that track meaningful outputs and outcomes from some of our investments. So I did just wanna note for our adaptation portfolio in particular, we currently utilize six standard indicators for our reporting. These will sound certainly relevant to many people in this room um, because they're similar or identical in some cases to indicators that other project partners, funders, and peer institutions also use to measure the effectiveness of adaptation investments. These are indicators that take the form of number of people using climate information or implementing risk-reducing actions to improve resilience, um, another indicator uh, is about number of laws, policies, regulations, and standards um, promoted or used to address climate change adaptation um, and, and several others. And I think I can certainly chat after um, I, I finish speaking our indicator handbook for those of you who do want to see sort of the written description of these indicators that we're currently using, four of which are output-based and two of which are outcome-based indicators. Now, I want to just note, of course, that there are several challenges um, in using some of these indicators, and we are exploring, utilizing, and developing additional outcome indicators for our adaptation portfolio. Um, these challenges with measuring adaptation, as was referenced as sort of the background for convening this call, are also quite familiar to people participating in the room today and span concepts and principles such as the fact that adaptation is inherently local and context specific. Evaluating adaptation requires consideration of multiple dimensions in time and space, and adaptation is nested within and linked to other levels of governance as well as priorities and values of the particular communities and organizations that we're working with. So layer on top of this, the need for a large organization like USAID to also try and bring together a consistent set of metrics, um, in part due to some of our reporting requirements that span the different sectors and geographies in which we work. 
I would pose the question to this group, how can we best measure, measure, capture and measure meaningful results of investments that reduce the impact of climate change and build resilience across all the places and spaces that USAID works? What might this look like in the humanitarian sector? Are the metrics appropriate for capturing adaptation results in development programs that might look as diverse as perhaps um, supporting an urban wash program in the Philippines, helping to improve individuals' climate resilience, or promoting an agricultural practice in a rural village in Kenya that also allows for farmers to adapt to ever worsening drought conditions. The way in which we're trying to measure adaptation for each of these programs and capture results over a limited five-year time scale in some ways due to the nature of the program cycle are just some of the challenges that we're grappling with and we're really eager to learn from others and continue our partnership as we reflect on these um, challenges and opportunities. So I suppose in just keeping my remarks brief, I'll mention that um, these are some of the things that we are thinking about right now. We will continue to collect the programmatic data to document our process and progress following the indicators that I earlier that, that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and I'm happy to share with this group if for those who are interested. Uh, and in a way, this is a really great moment and we're in a position where we're really keen to partner with some of our colleagues in the agency and certainly across the development community who are perhaps in a more established place with some resilience measurement approaches and techniques. Um, with that said, I'd invite my colleague Nate Ives to jump in and speak a little bit more on work that USAID is doing in terms of resilience measurement that also bridges um, sort of the climate change and adaptation space. So thanks over to you, Nate. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks to Lika for uh, inviting us to be on this panel. So, you know, to reemphasize some of the points that Catherine has already mentioned, USAID and the kind of the interaction between actually Catherine and I's roles is this um, reflection of kind of bifurcated measurement approach up till now. So Catherine has mentioned some of our climate adaptation measurement approaches, but they're still nascent. While in the Center for Resilience, we've been developing and testing a wide variety of approaches that have uh, are based on a more established resilience measurement framework and literature base, uh, which within it has elements that address climate adaptation. However, this lens is very focused upon our three to five year program cycle, which introduces limits that I'm sure we're all aware of and reveals the challenge in grappling between the inherent trade-offs like measurement precision and generalizability and operationalizability. Uh, a bunch of word soup there, but you know, I think we are challenged with trying to understand and, and have a complex idea of what resilience and climate adaptation are, are, is, but also make programmatic decisions based off uh, those information. So our resilience MEL approach has offered us an understanding of the effect and effectiveness of our resilience adaptation focused activities, which are central to USAID Be the Future initiative programmatic approaches, such as our support for the CG centers to produce improved drought resistant seeds, for example, and measure the adoption of these adaptations at the household level. Um, but it also focuses on understanding our uh, humanitarian assistance activities like food for peace. So this approach has limits when thinking about climate adaptation in a temporal way. For example, we're challenged uh, in understanding chronic and compounding past shocks and their effect on current day well being. Or alternatively, how do we think about the potential for upcoming shocks to shift the window of what adaptations are even feasible to be made in, in, in hospitable areas, whether that's from protracted climate uh, or conflict in areas where adaptation uh, may not even be possible, considering the magnitude of those future climate disruptions that exacerbate and compound these, these challenges. So we recognize the need to know whether our investment should continue to focus on protecting livelihoods and food security in climate effective areas, or whether we should focus on more expansive views of adaptation programming uh, where food might not be able to be reliably grown in the future. So while Catherine and I are currently grappling with uh, measuring climate adaptation in resilience and in the Bureau and agency, we're so keen for partners like all of you who are joining this call to continue your work and we want to be informed um, by that work and build measurement systems that are cohesive and and can really bring in the best of um, all of our understandings around how do we how can we um, make effective uh, and evidence-based programmatic decision decisions. 
So this is one reason that I'm really excited to hear from both Mark and Michael uh, and learn a little bit more about their research. And I'll pass it back to you, Talika, to, to if you have any comments. Thanks, thanks a lot, Nate and Catherine, and, and thanks so much for framing the kinds of questions that you are discussing within USA. I was remiss in sort of saying that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we had, um, uh, that Fernanda was also going to speak today and uh, Nate and Catherine came in, and I think that the, the two different perspectives coming from those two ways, uh, two areas of engagement is really, really important. And just wanted to say that Fernanda will come back uh, for the round table. Uh, so leading off with those questions, I would like to invite uh, Mark and eager to hear uh, Mark's thoughts on, uh, on the questions that USAID has raised. Mark is an associate professor in the International and Development Economics Group at the Charles Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University. And his research is focused on these topics, on the development of assessment tools and evaluation designs to measure the ways in which households and communities situated in stressed and shock prone contexts can achieve and maintain well-being, in other words, resilience. And as part of this work, he has served as the chair of the Resilience Measurement Technical Working Group uh, Professor Constas, he's currently serving as a director of resilience evidence for decisions in development initiative. Uh, so perfect person to speak a little bit more about uh, his thoughts. So over to you, uh, Mark, for some of your uh, thoughts on the topic. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing us together and thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen here. Very good. Do you have my screen now? Very good. Very good. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to be taking a, a bit of a, a step back. And as I was listening to the comments from our colleagues at USAID, I, I thought, well, they said in some ways a lot of what I'm going to try and say. But I, I'm going to say it in, in a slightly different way. And I was really glad to hear their comments, some of the tensions they're experiencing and working through at a programmatic level for measurement uh, within the agency are certainly ones that I've, I've observed and working through myself. Uh, to begin, I want to talk about what is the problem uh, to which resilience is a solution and where is the measurement needed? I just want to take us back because I want to talk about briefly about the, the place of, of climate shocks, although this is not my specialty. Um, I do want to talk about and acknowledge about where they fit into the, the problem of uh, problem of a, of a shock intensive environment, which resilience is meant to be a response to. And then I'll talk about how we can improve resilience measurement moving forward. And you'll see that I, I'll, I'll argue that we're, I think we're at an inflection point now. And I'll tell a brief story of the, brief, the resilience measurement story. So the question I think that we're asking and why we're gathered here today and why agencies are, and organizations are focused on resilience is, how can, well how can welfare be maintained and recovered in the face of multiple shocks, droughts, floods, pests, political conflict, health, food prices? And you know, we're concerned about these because of their individual and combined effect of the shocks and stresses on, on well-being, uh, on immediate mortality, diminished health, loss of livelihoods, and um, food insecurity, personal safety, economic instability, social welfare, and, and the list goes on uh, left and right for the effects and certainly for so for the shocks as as well. And uh, this is a point that Catherine mentioned in her talk and the multidimensionality of it and also the multi-level effects of which these shocks have an impact. However, it's important to acknowledge that climate change in some ways is the mother or father of, of all shocks and stressors. Um, I would, in fact, I think there's there's two uh, mothers or fathers and climate change and governance and institutions, and they, in fact, are also related. This is a point that I'll return to later on when I talk about shock propagation effects. But I think what we have here as a starting point is that we may talk about climate change and climate shocks and then climate adaptation, but the effects of those shocks are they propagate over space, over time, across levels. And it it's, gives us a, a complicated problem, which many people, I think, in system science refer to as a wicked problem. So what I want to do here, and before I get to my few comments here on 
what I think we may be focusing on the next generation of resilience and measurement is ask the question, question, where have we been? And I think we're three chapters into a story, the story of resilience and measurement. And we began, um, and people in USAID, and, and Greg will remember this keenly, and Tim Frankenberger as well. Um, chapter one was kind of mind the gap. We felt we had a limited number of options for measurement. And there also that was paired with initial skepticism about whether you know, whether or not resilience would last, what would its shelf life be? But there were very few models available at that time. Um, you, you, people who've been around for a while will remember uh, Diffid's piece, now SCDO, that they did. Uh, Tango had a piece that came out at a, at a similar time as a theoretical conceptual grounding for resilience, but there were few measurement options. And then that was followed by a period of uh, expansion and proliferation of methods and People will also recall, and some people I think in this group may have been authors of some of the review pieces that, that followed, but we had many methods and then people were scurrying around saying, which one's the best? How do we know which one to use? Um, and we had a challenge of selecting among methods. And there was institutional formations, USAID being one notable example with its uh, creation of their uh, Food Bureau of, of, uh, Bureau of Resilience, which replaced or consolidated other bureaus. And then we proceeded into, and I think we're in between a chapter three and a chapter four right now, where there are reviews that came out uh, from organizations and individuals such as uh, ODI came out with a review. Um, there was even a review on not just resilience, uh, but a re review that Tendall did on food systems resilience. We have the collision of those two ideas, which is really interesting and broad critiques. And so I think we're on a, we're at an inflection point now where we're digesting and making sense of the reviews and their innovations. And as Nate mentioned, is that uh, we do have a sta established approaches and we've arrived at a certain point. And I think we're, we're at a, a point where we can begin to think what's next. So what I want to do and the objectives of my brief comments is I have four and a half points to make. I want to refer very briefly to the importance of theoretical foundations uh, to the, uh, the need to highlight uh, ongoing theory development. Um, I also want to discuss the temporal dynamics, and this was mentioned by our colleagues in the USAID, and the focus on time-dependent features of resilience and thinking about path dynamics. Discuss the complexity of shocks very briefly and emphasize the importance of interactions. And then finally, harmonize resilience measurement, underscore the importance of empirical convergence. And I was glad to hear uh, um, Catherine mentioned this in, in her talk that they there is some standardization of, of, of approaches, at least within USAID. My half point, uh, I'll acknowledge I won't have time to go into, is uh, understanding the importance of generating resilience evidence that meets stakeholder needs. needs. And here we need to understand well, and articulate what the demand for resilience evidence is from various stakeholders, from donors to agencies to, to beneficiaries and to program staff who are working in few complex field environments, incorporate demand uh, into the protocols for resilience. And I would argue also incorporate it into our notion of what it means to conduct and carry designing and conduct rigorous resilience measurement. And then we also need to present findings and evidence in forms that are accessible and readily available. Uh, you know, my currency, there are a few other academics on, on this call as well, my currency are, are peer-reviewed journal articles. That's where our work is meant to end up. But I sometimes think peer-reviewed journals is where good ideas go to die. They don't have an afterlife and, um, and this is a bit of a problem. So we need to think about uh, translation mechanisms, different presentation formats. Very brief, I know we don't have much time, so I'm gonna go through this in pretty quick order. Uh, Tulika asked me to highlight some of the papers that I've done that are, that are related to these points. So I'll do that in rapid order as well. I could begin each one just with a, a brief uh, statement. Theory is valuable simply to assert my position. Uh, theory is valuable because it serves as an intellectual tool that helps one translate otherwise intractable forms into manageable forms, representations of which serve as shared points of representation for, for debate and starting points for systematic inquiry. So that's, I think, where we need to, is a really important overarching starting point. Remember that, that theory is a platform. In fact, it's the it's the, gen the early genesis, the, the starting point for thinking about harmonization, which is a point I'll make. Um, here, uh, I think we have made great progress in thinking about definitions, understanding dynamics that, that define um, 
resilience and how we're going to represent those in terms of models and as uh, Nate mentioned, operationalization, and I perhaps have more, um, you know, uh, multiple of words than he, he apologized for here. So I'll apologize again. The one thing I want to mention here is that the definition part of this is great progress, not altogether settled. Still, there's a question of resilience as an outcome, resilience as a capacity, resilience as a relationship. And I think it's all those things. What we're aiming for here is conceptual clarity. Uh, achieving analytical goals, empirical traction, and generative quality. Uh, we in the technical working group, which Talika uh, referred to in her introduction, uh, we generated a common analytical model. There are also a series of seven papers that we did in the technical working group that are available in FSIN. Um, the paper Chris uh, Barrett and I did some time ago uh, talked about expected realize and ex uh, expected future well-being as a way to model resilience. Uh, you know, that paper is now um, eight years old. We, we, we stand by it, but uh, we need other theoretical formulations, ones that bring climate into it more more directly. The, the drivers, what's driving our interest in resilience, um, a lot of it remains the same, but a lot of it's more complex than it, than it was. Temporal dynamics, uh, rates of magnitude of change or growth we seek to model are utterly indifferent to the arbitrary time limits imposed by measurement practice by programs, by policies, and by donor preferences, I've added on there. Um, so we are, and colleagues at USAID also made this point, is that we have you know, limited programming frames, but yet we know a lot of the drivers of, of, um, of the shocks and the shocks themselves are require much longer duration. We need more careful thinking about uh, how do we think about duration in terms of implementing resilience-oriented programs, resilience-building programs. What is a reasonable expected effect, uh, the time period for it? How long does it take to build governance? You know, we may have these ideas for food security to a certain extent around things like stunting and wasting and, uh, and micronutrient deficiencies, but building governance and, and looking for climate uh, impact effects is a different, different beast here. Uh, differently speeded variables for frequency and understanding rates of change is a related concept and also Periodicity is, is, is vital, thinking about intervals and patterns and critical thresholds. Uh, these all bring to mind notions of recovery and path dependence, and building resilience capacities, trigger events rather than retrospective analyses. Uh, Tim Frankenberger had mentioned before, uh, Tango has done work on uh, recurrent monitoring as USAID has, um, and uh, looking at trigger events. And this also brings into focus the humanitarian and development peace nexus. Uh, did a paper on this with um, with Erwin Nippenberg, Nippenberg, a graduate student, and Nathan uh, Jensen. Hope Erwin's not on the call. Apologies for the name, Erwin. Um, and um, and in that paper, we we had high frequency data, monthly data over the course of of two years, and being able to better track the volatility and understand the temporal dynamics. Um, and we use machine learning as well. I know Hope is on this call. Hope also has used machine learning in some of his work, her work. And so the, we have made great progress on this. The, um, the point, I'm looking at time here. How's my time, Talika? You have right, there's no time left. Okay, good. Complexity of shocks and stressors. Um, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, we need to uh, look at, uh, let me read the quote quickly, where resilience is motivated by the shared awareness of alter risk landscape. The detailed analysis of the complexity of shocks and structures that initially spurred interest in resilience has not been a key feature of resilience measurement. My point here is that I think we've not done a good, done a good job of, of monitoring one of the more complex elements of our model that is the shock component, and we need to. Um, I just make reference to two pieces of work I'm doing here with colleagues at uh, Ibadan University and also at, um, Academia 2063 and the Global Network. My final point is on harmonization, and I think we need to continue, and there's been a lot of progress. We're in a much better state, um, but harmonization is a multi-level affair, harmonizing on definitions, on measurement domains, metrics, and metrics and procedures. Um, I've done a paper here with colleagues at FAO, where we provide a framework that recently came out in global food security. We're thinking about harmonized metrics, which isn't the same as standardized, but it's providing an overarching framework. Um, and I think you know, the argument here is the variety of approaches used to measure resilience makes it difficult to communicate with stakeholders who may seek to measure resilience across settings and over time and to compare the results from one setting or time to the next. 
So in quick order, I've gone through those points. Uh, my conclusions are theoretical developments we need more to better capture realities and model the effects of, of climate impacts and other shocks. Uh, time matters for programming in measurement and in our inferences. And shocks are becoming increasingly complex uh, rather than less complex, yet that remains under specified. Um, and a common vision and conversion empirical work, accumulation of evidence and communication of findings will be enhanced by any efforts that we can uh, produce to har better harmonize our measurements. So apologies for, for taking maybe too much time and thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, that was really perfect. Uh, uh, thanks for going over and summarizing all the work that has happened on resilience measurement. And as, as our opening speakers alluded to, we're also trying to apply that research to measurement of climate resilience. What does it mean to be uh, to measure climate adaptation and what does it mean in the context of the work we are doing in climate adaptation and for that i would like to invite uh, uh, professor michael carter to speak about uh, his new work uh, on the topic michael carter is a distinguished professor of agriculture and socioeconomics at the university of california davis and honorary professor of economics university of cape town uh, he directs currently the basis markets risk and resilience innovation lab and Re resilience innovation facility author of numerous scientific publications uh, his current research examined poverty dynamics and productive social net social safety nets evaluation of interventions to boost uh, small farm uptake of improved technologies um, and uh, he's also looked at uh, several index insurance contracts mechanism to elevate chronic poverty and indeed um, seen as one of the key instruments for climate adaptation. Uh, Professor Carter is an elected fellow of NBER and also BRED, the Bureau of Research and Economic Analysis of Development. Uh, uh, I invite you to present your paper. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Toluca, can you hear me, hear me all right? All right, good. Yeah, so we had, uh, they always tell us to, to, to log in early to make sure things work. I'm actually in Nepal and everything went wrong, including my door key didn't work on my door in my hotel room when I came dashing back up here. So sort of a cascade, maybe that's a sign, but I'm resilient, so here I am. Um, so this is work uh, with Moa Lush. It's in some ways very simple. And we recognize its simplicity, but we hope by laying out um, some what we think are some clear and indeed some theory based ways of estimating resilience, we might actually inspire some ideas. So the title I've given us here is measure what you mean. The definition and estimation of economic resilience uh, using counterfactual. So we're going to focus fairly narrowly uh, on on economic um, uh, economic resilience. Okay. So um, I think Greg Collins is in the audience. So Greg, I'm going to blame you for this first bullet point uh, because I heard you say this at some point and it sort of stuck with me that namely economic resilience is the ability to manage a climate shock or other adversity with minimal compromise of current and future economic well-being. So that seems to me like a, a kind of a good common sense definition of what we mean by resilience. So how do we measure it? To, to me, this uh, this definition suggests that we really need to have two things if we're going to measure resilience. The first is we're going to have to observe the time path of some measure of household economic well-being after the household receives a shock. So I don't think we can do without that. And second and more importantly, uh, we need a counterfactual measure of what the current and future well-being of the household would have been without a shock. So to me, to, to work off of Greg's definition, if we're going to find out if how how severely compromised someone was by a shock, we we need a counterfactual. We know we need to know what they would have been. So, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, a, a, a resilience measurement. I'm actually going to be using um, fake data. It's data actually generated by uh, by agents at a dynamic stochastic programming model. But it's a known gener data generation process, which has some virtues, which I'll, I'll refer to. But I do think the ideas we're putting forward here are the sorts of things that could be measured uh, if we had, say, uh, panel data, LSM, LSMS data. Uh, I think one thing, one thing I'm not going to talk about, but it's a, an important thing, is you know what periodicity of data is needed. 
uh, you know, how do we think about the statistical power of measuring uh, resilience? So, so again, we're gonna, I'm gonna illustrate the operation of this measure, counterfactual based measure of resilience. Uh, and then I'm gonna show a way we could use it. So we're gonna introduce into the model a catastrophic insurance policy. And then we'll sort of rerun the data, rerun the model um, uh, using, uh, uh, using the, the, the catastrophic insurance. And we'll show how our measure can be used to generate a benefit cost and other measures of policy efficacy. Uh, and then I'll say just a little bit about something that, uh, uh, that actually Mark just uh, uh, alluded to, which is namely what happens when you have uh, processes that uh, are time or history dependent uh, or more generally when there are poverty traps. So I'll try to show that our measure is actually uh, robust to the existence of poverty traps and indeed gives some very uh, simple and I think e easy to understand uh, ways of looking at that. And in particular, try to show that when the data generation process includes at least a subset of households um, who, who can fall into a poverty trap from a shock, that the, their individual measure of resilience will actually become, will become negative. Okay, so let's just jump right in it. So as I've already mentioned, um, got an underlying dynamic model of optimal asset accumulation. Uh, as we first talk about this, this is gonna be a, a sort of single convergence kind of model that is there's no, there are no poverty trap mechanisms. There's no tipping points in the dynamic system that is generating the data that we want to uh, analyze. Uh, in our simple model, households are heterogeneous. Some are born richer, some are born poor. They have different levels of skill. Some are highly skilled, some are, are weakly skilled. Uh, and we're gonna generate data for a total of 14 seasons. Um, and for reasons that only an economist would find useful or perhaps slightly humorous, we're gonna number the seasons as running from negative three uh, to plus 10. And that's just because I wanna center your focus on season zero, which is when we're gonna introduce a shock uh, into our data uh, generating process. Um, so uh, as I say, then we're, this first go assumes all households are converging uh, toward a similar economic uh, equilibrium level. Um, and so the, the experiment that we wanna do that we can generate with our data is then sort of at season zero, we're gonna take a random sample of the households in our data set and we're gonna treat them with a severe shock. And by severe shock, I mean a shock that destroys something between 40 and 60% of their productive assets. So the notation here, and again, this I purposefully model uh, sort of made this notation look like the kind we probably are familiar with when we do income back, uh, impact evaluation. So the, if we think about the average or expected income of shock treated households, that's just the expected value of their measure of income for household I in period T. And the big superscript capital T means it's a treated household. That is, it's a household that's been subjected to a shock. Okay, uh, and then the other 50% of households did not experience the shock. So they're gonna serve as a, as a valid, statistically valid counterfactual of what the current and future years would have been for the households that received the shock. If we have time, we can sort of come back, uh, you know, when would a real world shock actually meet the conditions uh, that we require for sort of, sort of pure identification of the shock but here in our data, again, we're, 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 we're literally randomizing the shock. So we have a population filled with lots of heterogeneous individuals. We take a random sample and it's sort of in year zero, half of them get hit by the shock. The other half uh, sort of continue on their married way. So we're gonna denote the average or expected income in this, uh, these control households or the counterfactual households is the expected value of income uh, for those households. So what does that look like? So here we've estimated using our data on our um, imaginary 9,000 households. And uh, let's see, are, are you able to see my little hand waving here on the graph? Yeah. So here's, here's, we sort of start our simulation back here and the blue line represents the trajectory, the dynamic path of accumulation of households uh, that are not gonna be shocked. And the red line is the households 
that in fact are going to be shocked. So we have lots of data. We have a randomization of the shock. Shocked. So you can see the blue and the line, blue and red lines uh, uh, track each other quite closely, as you would like to see. You know, if you're doing a randomized identification of anything. So then the shock comes along, and it's quite a substantial shock. And so we see what happens in terms of the measured income of the shock households. It falls quite severely. And then the shocked households and the non-shocked households then sort of continue to do the, the data generation process, if you will. They continue to do the best they can given the circumstances that they face. And you can see the red line starts to slowly catch up with the blue. But by season 10 here, we can see there's still a substantial gap between them between what's going on. So a simple way to, to sort of think about this is clearly, you know, uh, is we can think about the initial drop in well-being. And then we say, suppose the household never recovered. And that gives us this horizontal resilience measurement line. So that entire size of that area, sort of a, sort of a quasi-trapezoid, I guess, of sorts or, uh, in, in this area, that's that's sort of what the total income loss would be compared to the counterfactual if there was no recovery. However, in our particular case, our particular data set, notice some households start to recover. So sort of an, an average, uh, a nice measure of resilience would be uh, how big is B compared to the overall size of the box? Okay, because notice the area B, that is the area between the zero resilience line and the red line that is the expected income that we've estimated for households who did receive the shock that that's a good measure of how much recovery took place and then the overall size of the box which is the areas a plus b is sort of how much recovery was possible so this area based measure namely b the area of b divided by the area of a plus b gives us a very natural measure uh, of resilience um, so for example notice if there was no recovery, then the red line would fall down, B would be squeezed to zero. And so households that don't recover at all would have a resilience measure of zero. A household that sort of recovered almost instantly, um, the area A uh, would get squeezed away to zero. And then notice the resilience measure would approach one. So in this case, we can sort of think of a measure that has a very sort of natural interpretation running from zero, meaning no recovery, to one, uh, to meaning full and complete recovery. So again, back to Greg Collins' thing, what we're trying to say is we want a measure that tells us how resilient people are is here measured as the degree to which current, so contemporaneous with the shock, how much current well-being was, was, uh, was damaged, but also how much future well-being was damaged. But again, we're, we've got a valid counterfactual because we're not just sort of saying, we're not saying, do people get back to where they were when the shock happened? Because the full cost of the shock is that plus the foregone growth in this model that these households would have had had they not had the shock. So our measure is trying to capture that as we move forward. Um, we can actually, we actually measure this, we can measure this at the individual level, the way we've done it here is this this term here y hat c that's a matched counterfactual for person i that depends on their initial level of income or wealth and also their heterogeneous skill and so this is just this is an analog uh, or an individual specific measure uh, to what we just saw in, in the graph which portrayed the average level of resilience so if you come down here to the second graph at the bottom of this slide you notice the scale goes from zero to one. And in our data set, which has noise and other, uh, and, and the heterogeneity within it, we can see that the resilience goes from about 0.25. So those are households that barely were recovering at all to other households whose resilience measure uh, were closer to 0.7. So there's a distribution of resilience uh, even within, the, even within, this, uh, within this, this data set, okay? Um, for policy purposes, it's often very useful um, to think about having an economic measure of this. So again, let me blame uh, let me blame some earlier conversations with Greg Collins 
you know, the question policymakers might, might want to know is, you know, what does a dollar spent on promoting resilience actually bring me? So as a first step in being able to measure that, we can simply take the present value of our resilience measure. So the beta T is just a discount factor. And, uh, and so the numerator then becomes the, uh, uh, becomes the, the, the total loss that's possible if households had never recovered at all. And then we see what the actual uh, resilience of those households is by comparing the numerator. So let me not, I don't want to scare anybody or get anyone stuck on that ugly notation. But let me show you where this becomes a useful sort of thing to do. So we took our model and we said, okay, let's sort of think about a resilience promoting intervention. So since, uh, as was mentioned, uh, I've done quite a lot of work on, on various kinds of agricultural insurance policies. So for our experiment, we imagined that the government had made a commitment and in fact purchases for every household in our, in our study, in our data set, uh, catastrophic insurance policy. Okay, so this is a catastrophic policy in that the government is not trying to replace all assets that might be lost. It simply purchases this policy that steps in when shocks are severe, such as the shocks that we use in our example. So the policy only begins to pay for shocks uh, when the shocks uh, destroy 40% of what people have. In addition, it's not a great policy uh, and again, this is just for illustrative purposes. We're not advocating this as a policy. But then once the household loses more than 40% of the assets, then this policy simply replaces uh, for the household half of every asset or loss beyond the 40%. Okay. Now, using the underlying data generation process, we actually know what the probabilities of these shocks are. These severe shocks against which we're trying to protect households are basically one in 20 year events. And to sort of make this a balanced look at the benefit cost ratio of the resilience promoting catastrophic insurance policy, um, we, we assume that the government has actually been buying the insurance for everybody in this economy for 10 years. Okay, so, so 10 years prior to year zero, the government is purchasing an insurance policy in our case, for all 9,000 individuals uh, in the sample. And after 10 years, half the people uh, get this severe shock. So that's consistent with the pricing of the policy, which assumes the shock is at roughly a one in 20 year uh, kind of event. In what we've done so far, uh, we've ignored the behavioral consequences of insurance. Uh, so one thing, uh, one thing uh, I've certainly been quite, become quite convinced of when households know they are resilient, they actually change their investment behavior and invest more, and that's what we call resilience plus. Uh, there's a recent paper in Journal of Risk and Insurance that I wrote uh, with Sarah Jansen that sort of really plays this out, I think, in, in, in quite a lot of detail. So what happens? So the blue line and the red line are as we saw them before. The green line is sort of the the optimal recovery of households who, with a year lag, get a uh, get an, get a, a monetary transmission of half of what they lost over 40 percent, and you can see the resilience gain, if you will, of having the policy versus not having the policy is this intermediate-sized area C. So that's the resilience gain. Um, so to put it in in sort of economic policy terms then, as I said, we, we can price out the cost of providing this kind of insurance. And we say, what's the benefit of that? And when we do that, uh, so we, we value the resilience gain across all the people, and we compare that to the policy which purchased insurance for 10 years in advance of the shock, right? Uh, we did that for all those people. That actually gives a benefit cost ratio in this particular example of, of about, of about 1.8. The actual present value of our resilience measure when we provide this is quite substantial. The, re the resilience measure before was without the insurance policy was 44%. That is households were only recovering about 44% of the future and current income that was lost. And it jumps to 71%. And then the cost of the policy is not cheap. 
we had it marked up, as you may have noticed in one of my earlier bullet points, by 25% to sort of present it as a commercial product. So when we when we when we fully account for the cost of this policy, then we see it's a it's it's good, right? It's a good policy. It was a good investment in the sense that it generated more benefits uh, by far, almost twice as much benefits as it actually cost. So the final thing I'll do here is bring up something that I think is really is really quite important. And and I want to quickly show you how this class of measure that we're proposing works when there's actually a poverty trap uh, in, in the model. So a poverty trap here, without going into dreadful detail, we can simply think of as a tipping point. And a tipping point here, if you're a household and you're sort of at the edge of being able to move forward to escape poverty, and that's what the individuals were doing in, in the prior version of the data generation process. Now we're saying some people are at an edge where if, they, if, they, if the shocks are too big, then it's no longer possible them. It's no longer economically uh, optimal, if you will, for those households to move forward over time. So there are gonna be permanent consequences. So this is a model now that has multiple equilibria in it. Not everybody is subject to that multiple equilibria. Some people sort of recover, but other people don't. Uh, I think it's a realistic representation of what you might actually expect to see uh, in the real world. Um, we can talk about that more if anyone is interested, but let me just illustrate how our measure works. It's the same measure we talked about before. So again, we need it. We, every person has a matched counterfactual, so we can sort of see where they are in period T and compare them to where they would have been in period T. And notice these bars over here to the left of zero and negative, it shows a, there's a, a rather substantial fraction of this population. It's about 15 or 20% of this population that actually when the shock hit them, they fell below the tipping point. And the resilience is negative in the sense that, you know, they not only stopped, they didn't come here and recover, they went here and if we plotted those households that fell into a poverty trap, they actually fall down. And so in the end, their, their counterfactual loss their lack of resilience is gigantic, right? It's, it's all the way to, to a much lower level here. So I think, you know, interestingly enough, the resilience measure is in number one, in the first instance, is a really good indicator of these kind of poverty track dynamics. But more importantly, it helps us, it helps us see what's, what's, what's going on uh, and, and with, a, with a population. If we do the same kind of policy experiment that we talked about before, so again, now we're in a world with poverty traps where shocks can have permanent consequences, which will show up as negative resilience. What we see is when we introduce it, let's just focus on the bottom line number here, then the benefit cost ratio, again, in this artificial example, uh, goes up quite substantially to over two. Um, and that, that, that much larger increase is happening because the insurance is actually boosting a number of people back into a situation of, of, of economic viability where they can again begin to reapproach where they would have been uh, without the shock. So in summary, um, I think some of the prior approaches to resilience measurement have some kind, sometimes confused resilience defined as in my Greg Collins sort of way, have confused resilience with other processes of poverty and income distribution dynamics. So what we're trying to say is, is in a very simple way, we can create measures that, that should allow us to really capture what we mean by economic resilience. This method is robust to the existence of poverty traps that actually helps us understand features. And we could take these measures, for example, and analyze them, you know, subject to statistical identification. Conditions, we could start to ask ourselves, let's look at the subsets of the population who are not resilient, what are their characteristics? In, in our model, it's a very simple process, but in, in real world, uh, we, could actually, we could actually move forward. Again, and in, in, in finally, in the real world, it's not always the case that, um, that shocks hit people randomly, uh, but they do hit, you know, uh, there may be some people may live in more risk exposed areas. So there'd be some identification concerns that you want to do. But again, I think those of us 
at uh, who worked, and it's most of us, I suspect, on this call, are producers and consumers of uh, uh, producers and consumers of impact evaluation. And I think thinking about this problem through the lens of a counterfactual is is a way that can can be helpful. So let me um, let me stop there. Uh, I think that was kind of a lot, uh, but hopefully I managed in my jet lag state to. Uh, at least get uh, at least get some of the the basic ideas forward. So, uh, so Luca, back to you, please. Thanks a lot, Michael, and thanks so much for uh, walking us through that. Uh, despite being <clears throat> in a jet lag state, as you mentioned. Um, so actually, we are about two minutes away from the panel time, and we uh, I did plan to have a Q and A with the panel. But here's what we're going to do: we're going to adapt, which is uh, which is the theme of the. Um, Conversation, anyways, today. Um, and Derek, I think you can uh, pull up the um, uh, the roundtable participants, and we can bring them into the conversation. And I will go and go ahead and ask the questions that I had uh, I had for um, Michael, Mark, Nate, and Catherine, and then just start bringing in the roundtable uh, experts also into the conversation, if that makes sense. Um, why don't we go ahead and do that? We can take a few minutes for the adjustments as, as needed so that we can just move into the Q&A, so uh, into the roundtable part. If that makes sense, does that make sense to everyone uh, in the panel? And I think that all the uh, panelists and the roundtable experts can all keep their videos open. So we feel like we are in person uh, in, say, the University of Arizona. The downtown space was uh, fabulous, Greg, and we even brought back mugs. But at least we hope we can, <laughs> we can see each other. Uh, we are certainly saving some um, uh, greenhouse gases by doing a virtual event. So welcome, Fernanda, Hope, Lindsay, Mo, Tim, uh, to the conversation, and Greg. So, Luca, did you ask me a question? I'm sorry, my my audio died. For, my uh, audio died for a moment. Yeah, we, I can still hear you. Can you hear me, uh, Michael? Yes, I can hear you now. I've got my phone up to my ear, so. Okay, so I think that I'm seeing that uh, a lot of the attendees are still uh, with us, and I think we can just, I had a five minute break plan, but uh, why break if we can just continue, that's okay. So I want to uh, go back, Michael, to your uh, presentation and kick off the conversation there. You alluded to this uh, as, you're, as you're closing off, a lot of the people attending today are evaluators, a lot of the I would imagine the crowd for Mathematica are also evaluators. So speaking a little bit about what you're proposing, and you know you have a simulation model. Uh, so there are three things that uh, that you, you have it neatly organized, and if you can speak to what evaluators could do. So first of all, the fact that you say that the climate shock will not necessarily be um, may not even be felt when you do the data and baseline data at the time that you do data collection. So one of the things that People grapple with a lot is how do you do this timing right? Uh, and then, as you said, that it's not necessary that the climate shock is randomly distributed across, uh, or, or that people there are first of all that there are people who receive the climate shock and people who don't in your study and sample, and then there could be potential systematic biases that might exist in populations that uh, get the shock, and if there is any sort of historical proclivity for certain areas to get the shocks if possible. For example, the populations are more resilient. So to Nippenberg's paper talked about, uh, you know, people in the floodplains are more resilient. So what have you? So you could speak a little bit about, about uh, this particular um, piece. And the second one more point I do want to insert, which takes us back into the conversation around uh, definitions. Um, so I, I, I like the way that you know you described it as you're describing resilience as a way of sort of coming back to equilibrium, so to speak. There's that uh, line up top that you're coming back to, and you're able to con, you know sort of also bring in this idea of poverty trap because one of the metrics that are being 
the sort of the other alternative approach is the probability of following below uh, you know, a desirable stage, which is either a poverty trap or whatever, uh, which is called resilience as a normative condition. Um, so what happens in your population if everybody is already below poverty line? And then how do you sort of sort of translate that metric in that kind of a population? And how does that separate mm -hmm. itself from this idea of resilience as a probability of falling below a desirable state? So I'll leave you with uh, start off with you with those two questions and um, and then we can continue the conversation. Okay. Yes. Let me pick on the, the last question that you asked in there. Um, so what we do really, uh, uh, the mechanism of people falling below a threshold has become called poverty traps, but our method has nothing to do with poverty measurement. Um, and I think the definition, you know, my sort of stylized definition of resilience is, you know, the, the, the ability to withstand minimal damage to, to your current and future well-being. That also doesn't mention poverty. I mean, you could focus this if you wanted to on people that were poor. The poverty trap mechanism is important because it shows up in our model as negative resilience. Now, if we want to say those people are falling into poverty traps, that has a certain kind of linguistic value, discursive value, uh, I think. But it's not, it's not in any way essential to what we're doing. Uh, in, in, and as I say, I, I, the, I, what I think is really vital that we're trying to get across here is what the counterfactual is giving us is, you know, giving us a, trying to come up with a measure of where people, you know, would have been without the shock so that we can see how far did they fall, how quickly did they recover, or if, if they're in a tipping point system, if their resilience is actually negative, then they continue to go downward. I actually wrote a paper way back in about 2006. It's the only paper in the history of development economics that compares Ethiopia and Honduras. But in that, we, we looked at two shocks. One was Hurricane Mitch in Honduras, and we were able to see that some households uh, not only got knocked down by the shock, but then they continued a downward spiral. So effectively, what we're saying is whether we call those people poor or not, it's, a, it's an extreme part of the cost of a shock in terms of foregone well-being and and that's why the our resilience measure actually becomes less favorable when poverty trap mechanisms are in there or conversely if you want to focus on the on the happy side of it uh in in the presence of a world where there is a tipping point then giving people tools to be to 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 uh, to become resilient actually has a very large return relative to what they would be without that without that policy uh, intervention. And then real quickly, I'll just say one of the next steps Mo and I are taking is to actually apply these measures to real data. So one that we're, we're considering working with uh, comes from another hurricane, namely Hurricane Ida in, uh, in Mozambique a couple of years ago. It just so happens uh, a project being run by Dean Young at the University of Michigan was looking at a, uh, an intervention uh, and he has before data and after data. And if you've ever looked at time, at the at, at hurricane maps, you know they don't uh, they don't wipe out entire areas. They have kind of a finicky path that they followed. And in that data, uh, Dean has already measured you know the degree of exposures to the shock. So that's exactly the kind of thing we need to do. Now we we need to be mindful that people with certain characteristics were not more exposed, more likely. To shocks, but the, then that is a that's the kind of thing that we worry about all the time when we have a, imperfect experiments in impact evaluation, and there there are ways to deal with it. So that's kind of where we're headed here. Is uh, uh, you know I think there there are lots of uh, instances where we either ha either have ongoing data collection or we happen to be doing a study and suddenly uh, a big shock comes along and hits some people, doesn't hit other people. And the Mozambique data is 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 one instance of that. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Michael. Um, so Kate and Catherine, I mean, you uh, had the benefit of hearing Mark and uh, uh, and Michael, and Michael has a specific approach, and sort of Mark sort of outlined overall uh, the discourse on on the theory, on the harmonization. 
Uh, and I just wanted to bring you in, Nate, you made this a uh, couple of points about the couple of specific um, uh, key features of studying climate change, right? One is this idea of chronic shocks, right? So there isn't a shock that happens at a specific time. There's a slow burn piece of it. And the other part, which is kind of fascinating and very important is this um, uh, idea that, you know, what does it mean to come back to the same level if really that area is just going to be difficult to live in? We're talking about um, um, managed retreat or what have you. So keeping those two things in mind, what are your reflections of what you what you heard and, uh, and what are your further questions? Yeah, I mean, I think Dr. Carter's work is like, really interesting and reflects some of uh, additional work that we've been doing at USAID as well in, in terms of modeling the impacts, um, you know, at the household level. But I think, you know, I think it we're still grappling, I think, with the same challenges that he's alluded to, which is, you know, risk isn't necessarily randomly distributed, and um, how do you how do you match that up also with our our programming, which is not also, you know, it tends to be targeted. It's not randomly distributed either, uh, or it doesn't. And so how do you like match that up with um, doing impact evaluations that can be timely and can provide the sort of evidence base that we need to, to scale up interventions at, at, a, at a large rate to, in order to meet the challenges that we have? Um, you know, I think the the approach that um, is identified, I think, is a really strong way to, to look at that and one that we're really interested in. Um, but, you know, how do we operationalize that? I think becomes the, the key question. Um, I don't know, Catherine, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, Catherine, it would be great to get your thoughts on it. I was also curious about um, the, the indicators and metrics that you mentioned and spoke about. Um, um, and, you know, in terms of specifically thinking more in terms of the final impact measure, like how would you define like a climate resilient household? And does it match with this idea of coming back and, you know, recovering back your levels that you have, you know, the way that might be described it, like with and without a shock. Um, yeah, yeah, I can jump in briefly. I mean, I don't know that I have that much to add from what Nate's already shared. In terms of defining what climate resilience looks like, I might actually invite Fernanda to jump in and speak a little bit to that. But I think we recognize that you know, whether we come up with various theories of change for some of the key sectors that we're working in resilience to climate change and on what time scales is going to obviously look different depending on which sector we're working in and geography we're working in. So uh, to your question on the indicators, I mean, those to me are the equivalent of what um, Dr. Carter was speaking to of you know, imperfect, but field based data that we do have often due to, as Nate was alluding to various programmatic decisions that have been made. Maybe in real time, or maybe a couple of years ago about where we're programming our adaptation funds. And those are the pieces of data that we can look to, to really understand. Impact um, from some of our direct adaptation programs, but the utilization of some of these broader model based approaches to perhaps more holistically try and understand how we're building and promoting resilience outside of simply programmatic investments. So, for example, in enabling policy systems to maybe strengthen adaptation commitments or so on are things that we're starting to work through now. Um, but I think Fernanda might have some additional perspective about this. You know, what is the definition of climate resilience for a household, let's say, or um, other other uh, levels of the community. So I'll, if it's okay, round out with the USAID thoughts and invite her. Oh, to yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Thanks, Fernanda. Um, Thanks so much for taking me up, uh, uh, Catherine. Uh, if, if it's okay with you, Chalika, what I'd like to do is maybe just reflect a little on the panel and, and kind of come full circle back to this question of what we mean by climate resilience. And I just I wanted to begin by saying that that the panel, I think, um, the, the, underscored the diversity of approaches we're taking to really tackle some fundamental questions around resilience. And I'll focus a little bit my, my, my points on 
um, adaptation or climate adaptation itself rather than the resilience writ large. And so just taking the proverbial step back and recognizing that adaptation really refers to adjustments and social, ecological, or economic systems in response to both current and expected climate impacts as the kind of the definitional starting point. I think some of the fundamental questions that the panel was really uh, tackling with is, you know, how do we know if what we're doing is working to meet our objectives? Are we building the resilience of communities and partners? How do we know if we are do what we're doing is enough? And perhaps more importantly, what if we aren't doing enough? Or what if we're doing the wrong um, things? And so I think these questions really underscore the fact that risks are interconnected and adaptation um, needs to grapple with multiple risks if it is going to succeed. And indeed, we know that the collision of climate, COVID, and, compact and conflict has shown that these interactions can often overwhelm our capacities to respond. And so building on the insights from the panelists, I just want to highlight maybe three frontier streams of research and work in the measurement space that we at USAID are really grappling with. Um, the first is sort of a growing body of evidence that is emerging from the co-developed uh, climate information services around the world. Um, and at the most very most basic, these are these can include early warning systems that can save people's lives by providing lead time warnings to help people evacuate. For example, if you live in a floodplain and a flood is coming, in farming systems, they also bundle together um, know-how. Uh, forgive me, resources as well as know-how and tailored climate information to help farmers make decisions about what to plant, when to plant and input choices based on climate forecasts. And what we're seeing is that farmers with access to these systems really are increasing their yields and income significantly in the face of shocks and stresses. But if we take the premise that the value of information is in its ability to support a decision, the question is, how could capacities measured in resilience help us unpack the value of that additional bit of climate information? and supporting the resilience of farmers in the face of a changing climate, given that this is packaged with a lot of other supports. And so reflecting, Michael, on your model, how do we tease apart the value of that small additional piece of information to add more clarity to the way people make decisions? The second point I really wanted to focus on was a tension that exists within the climate adaptation space, which I think is reflected in some of what the panelists is, um, mentioned, is a, a tension between measuring process and measuring progress. In the adaptation community, we're really beginning to tackle or focus um, our, our efforts around climate resilient development pathways, almost as a conceptual and aspirational idea to steer societies and the places where we work towards low carbon, kind of ecologically safe futures. And these are, um, in this space, sorry, we really need to know how measurement frontiers, particularly in resilience and the methods the panels discussed can be applied to track almost resilience capacities around critical principles like diversity and connectivity and participation and redundancy and, and many others. And finally, uh, I think it's probably uh, safe to say that the truth is that neither adaptation nor resilience are always just local, they're never just local, as it's often claimed, but these are often nested within and linked to higher levels of governance and sometimes unavoidable, sometimes helpful and necessary, sometimes unfavorable ways. And thus, these are sort of inextricably linked uh, across scale in their chances for success. So as climate impacts become more visible and increasingly borderless, the complex linkages between global adaptation and local implementation need to be better measured. And in this vein, transboundary risks uh, will require transboundary solutions. We really need to explore options to collaborate um, across resilience and adaptation to build policy coherence across borders and look for ways to embed both risk assessments and risk management in the implementation not only of adaptation, but of broader sets of policies and plans in support of development. So I just wanted to leave you with a couple of, of, of those thoughts. And, and these are 
questions that I think can only be answered by working together, building processes that really focus on empowering communities, um, linking resources across scales, and supporting effective communities of practice, such as the one that was kicked off um, through that through this event, as well as the University of Arizona sponsored event earlier in the year. And we at USAID are really keen to, to look for um, opportunities to engage with the broader measure, measurement community to tackle these challenges. Hopefully that's helpful. That was fabulous. Thanks a lot, Fernanda. Um, I, I did want to go back to Mark, who was one of our panelists with a question, and I think I will lift off on what Fernanda just said. It helps me uh, set the stage for my question, and then I would uh, go on to invite um, all of uh, all of the other panelists to comment on. So I think that the, the, some of the things that you mentioned, Fernanda, sort of point us. So, you know, I'm trying to keep the framing very much around measurement. There's so much to be done, as you're saying. How do we know what's working? How do we know what's enough? It seems like the measurement piece has to answer three broad pieces, right? It has to measure. Uh, we have to have a way of measuring to figure out targeting. We need to figure out where we need to invest our resources the most. We need to have a framework and approach to understand what are the drivers for, uh, you know, achieving climate resilience. What are, how are these complexities related? And so that we can craft the right kind of information. And then, of course, we need to know if it works, which is the evaluation space, which maybe seems a little bit more tractable than others. And it seems like, Mark, what you, you presented and your harmonization piece that you particularly presented, you are talking about the harmonization along that whole spectrum where you're saying, well, we need to know what the shocks and stresses are. We need to have a way of sort of addressing that. There is this whole thing of, you know, you're measuring resilience across a whole series of geographies, different types of sectors. And how do you sort of uh, equalize the notion of the severity of the shocks as you're as you're looking at people's ability to bounce back. Then there is this piece of harmonization around understanding the capacities, which Fernanda talked about, you know, uh, resilience capacity. Uh, and then how do people, what are the strategies households use to adapt to those shocks and stretches, all of which then leads to the, um, you know, the effect it has on the well-being. So you're calling for a harmonization there. And could you say, uh, in terms of what you were saying, Fernanda, Nate and Catherine asking for in terms of the way forward. Uh, how does that um, specifically move the needle forward? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, I'm. Yeah, you know, I'd like to comment and then also comment on on Michael's talk as well, since I have my mute off. But I'll um, I'll comment on the harmonization piece. I, I think that um, the I went through that slide pretty quickly, but think about harmonization as being having several. Um, Sense dimensions or or phases that one needs to go through, go through is uh, settle on substantive or conceptual harmonization. Is what what is it that we're we measuring? I still think there's some some um, movement in in literature and even in our discussion today about whether we're talking about capacities or resilience as an observed outcome. And it's fine to have that kind of pluralism, but you know we need to be settled and I think speak clearly. Michael's definition of it in following uh, following the um, implication uh, from from Greg um, on economic work works really well from from my perspective. And so, but for me, I think one of the real big pieces of the puzzle here, I'm going to connect this back to my, to Michael's talk and the methodology, is the shock piece. I really think we don't have that well specified, and um, and shocks don't stay in place and the way i want to explain this is talking about how we use counterfactuals in ordinary evaluation design and we typically use counterfactuals to talk about a, a treatment or an intervention a program or, or a policy and the problem is and the challenge is people want to know did it work did the program have its its intended impact and we can construct a counterfactual against that some kind of plausible counterfactual using a range of, of tools that we have that are now well tested and broadly accepted from RCTs to residue score matching uh, diff and diff or, or RDD. But the problem is, is that we don't have a unified it in many of our counterfactuals. So programs are and interventions are variously um, implemented. Uh, their implementation uh, varies greatly from site to site and varies over time, depending on capacity and depending on conditions. Local stakeholders sensibly adapt them. So when we say that it work, 
uh, our carefully constructed counterfactual at the core of it often is, is flawed because the, we don't have a single it. So let me take that same logic and apply it to the notion of constructing a counterfactual around shocks. It works well, and in the, in the, you know, Michael, you really like your approach and, and applaud it. Um, and it works well for modeling purposes in, in the environment in which you, in which you implemented it in a, in a using a, um, in a, with simulated data. But the problem we have is that when we ramp that up and we take it out to the real world is we don't have a uh, modular or static counterfactuals. And I don't think you're suggesting that. This is going to be a challenge we'll have to deal with all of us when we go out there is that um, shocks propagate over time. Um, the counterfactual set, if we're going to construct a counterfactual around shocks, then we need a dynamic counterfactual or maybe multiple counterfactuals. And so for me, this is one of the, the core elements what I'm, a lot of my work is now focused on is coming up with a multi-dimensional dynamic uh, shock index and understanding how shocks are, are composed. And if we just think about a few shocks right now, think about, um, Pest, wind, pest, drought, flood, uh, livelihood shock, and, and illness in, in a family take six shock shocks. The combinations are at any one point in time doing static analysis, the combinations are six factorial. That's huge. And then we want to look at these things dynamically over time. And so I think if we're, if we're going to be constructing counterfactuals, we need some, a dynamic way of constructing those counterfactuals that reflect the realities of what people are experiencing in the world are up against climate shocks. And that second slide that I had, just showing a subsample of potential shocks, I think it is, is a real challenge. And I, you know, I think we have now, we have the tools and people are beginning to use them using big data analytics and, and machine learning. I think we have the opportunity to do that. And more analysts are, are moving in that direction. Because I mentioned Hope's work that Hope is doing is, is an example of that. Over, I'll stop there. Thanks. Since you, uh, since you mentioned Hope, uh, Hope, do you want to jump in and provide any thoughts on this couple of broad points that we're discussing in, in terms of um, making the literature on measuring climate adaptation, the issue of sanitizing shocks um, across? I think maybe just two points and maybe more questions than, yeah. than comments. So one is sort of thinking about and we've talked a little bit about newer methods here and, um, you know, Michael's outlining some new approaches um, that are rooted in established theory that are really important uh, and exciting. And, um, and Mark's talking a little bit about using some machine learning methods to do some of these estimations, but we're not really talking about new data sources. So I'm wondering if people have thoughts about the potential utility of using new kinds of high frequency surveys or, well, I guess Mark did talk about the survey. I'm assuming that's the CRS data, Mark, that you were talking about the high frequency monthly data on the um, Malawian households. So using high frequency surveys, using satellite data, I mean, is that, are there opportunities there that we should be thinking about or is that sort of gonna lead us in the, in sort of a, you know, is it gonna distract us from the, the main, objective here. Um, and then I suppose the other thing was, I was thinking about whether measurement, um, whether we want to think about measurement in different ways for different purposes here. So we're talking about, you know, resilience has different kinds of utility as a concept, even for people that are in this um, discussion, right? So using resilience as a impact evaluation outcome can sometimes provide a more nuanced assessment of the true effects of a study, right? So I know Michael has a really beautiful paper that I really like, which I think is in review right now, where they show that this bundling of different kinds of ways to protect people from kind of uh, severe production shocks versus sort of lighter touch production shocks, I think. I mean, Michael can be more specific about that. Um, he, they can sort of back out what the effects are on households um, being resilient or, or recovering from shocks uh, compared with the control group um, in a way. So, so anyway, so that gives you some additional insight into the effect of an intervention. But then there's also sort of understanding and measuring resilience so that we understand something more fundamental about household welfare dynamics. Um, and then there's sort of thinking about policy and planning. And 
I, I suppose one could argue that those are all, they're all related, but it does seem in terms of the mechanics of measurement that um, they might have different kinds of data requirements, at least in the near term, if we're trying to be pragmatic. So I suppose those are kind of two things that I'm wondering if people yeah. have thoughts about. Well, I, actually, the couple of things you mentioned were the things that I was hoping to take the panel towards, whether uh, A, there are different um, objectives, and B, what role high-frequency measurement has. I, I was looking at some of the papers. In the end, there is a lot of need for recurrent monitoring or high-frequency data. So I think I would bring uh, Tim into the conversation. Tim, you worked done a lot of work on resilience um, Understanding resilience dynamics, resilience analysis, uh, and it sort of is getting to this uh, piece about how household welfare dynamics. But then, of course, you end up measuring the well-being aspect, realized with the uh, resilience piece too. So, if you want to come into this conversation, uh, re reflecting on uh, Michael's proposal and 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 Mark's uh, points around shock measurement too, and Greg, just to tee you up, I think it'll be great to have you come in right after Tim. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Very well. Okay. Um, I guess one of the one of the issues uh, pulling from every both Mark and Michael's presentations, and what we've been trying to do in, in the measurement work what we do, um, we recognize that the, the shock dynamic changes over time, and the severity of the shocks change. So we try to calculate um, shock severity. Uh, every time we measure the num both the number of shocks and how severe the shocks are every time. And then what is really critical, which was kind of missing in Michael's presentation, was these capacities that uh, Fernando also talked about. I think there, there's an array of capacities that people rely on to manage those shocks and stresses. And so to really understand the dynamic between people and how they manage shocks and stresses, you really need to understand what they're working with. I think one of the real values of the concept of resilience versus the concept of vulnerability was that we are really focused on people's ability to manage things. You know, their their capacity, their 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 you know agency, and um, we have to take into account that this varies very much across households and communities and on the way that they can actually do this. And that's going to have a lot to do with how successful a particular intervention that you're promoting is going to be in an area. And so if you don't take all of those things into account, you still need to measure the well-being outcomes and whether or not they got better or worse. Um, but we, you need to have a, a perception of all of these things and how they interact with each other to, to really capture what resilience is all about. Um, and, and so I'll stop there and let Greg Tim, before I go back to Greg, just to follow up a little bit on what you said and connecting to what Hope said, right? So, um, if we were to sort of separate out the objectives, uh, do you think that the measurement of capacities is essential or necessary if you're doing the impact evaluation piece, you know, the intervention, you're trying to understand whether it had an effect on, you know, resilience, which will be measured by some sort of a well-being based measure. So, is it necessary for that or is it? Or you are arguing that it's a really important component of understanding the household welfare dynamics so that you are designing the right so you could part of, Yeah, part of our theory of change has always been that intervention, different interventions strengthen different capacities. Some capacities are enable households and communities to manage shocks better in the short term. Some capacities are those that recognize that change is here for good and that you need to do things completely differently. It might mean changing your crops or changing your animals or getting out of agriculture altogether. And then some of those capacities have to do with the enabling conditions that are in place, whether governments are able to provide services, whether markets are able to function properly, whether the right policy environment is in place. And so if you don't take a look at all three of those and understand how those interact with the shock environment that people are dealing with, then you won't necessarily have the right uh, intervention that's actually going to improve what happens to these populations. Now, the other thing I think is really critical, and it's based on stuff we've been looking at over the last couple of years, is that investments in resilience programming are important, but sometimes the shock environment becomes so significant and so overwhelming that 
this HDP thing that Mark was talking about has to be taken for seriously. Um, there needs to be a time when you recognize that humanitarian assistance, whether that be cash transfers or some other kind of transfers, is needed to protect your investments. If it comes too late or if it comes in too small of amount, um, and is it not at the scale it needs to be, uh, then we can lose millions of dollars of our, of our investment. And so I think that it's really important that we understand that resilience does require us to understand how those three things interact with each other, the development aspects, the humanitarian aspects, and the peace building or, or dealing with conflict. And all of those are going to be more and more important as we go forward, because the areas in West Africa that we've been working in for the last seven years, conflict has only gotten worse. Uh, Northern Kenya, conflict has gotten worse. Ethiopia, conflict has gotten worse. And so if we don't take that seriously in the way that we program, we're never going to really build resilience. I'll pass it on to Greg. Thanks, uh, Talika, you can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Sir. Great. Maybe just picking up for what Tim said, I think sometimes there's this uh, false dichotomy between capacity approaches and measuring resilience through what happens to well-being. In fact, most of the approaches that USAID has used in the past look at what happens to well-being in the face of shocks and stresses, but they also measure capacity so they can explain the sources of resilience that help explain why some households and communities fare better than others. So I don't think it's an either or. Uh, looking at capacities is just looking at the explanatory variables to explain why uh, what happens to well-being in the face of shocks and stresses. So I don't think it's as much a divergence as, as maybe is sometimes uh, painted. And I agree with um, Tim that there there is always going to be shocks and stresses that overwhelm the capacity of households and communities to manage on their own. And so some who are concluding that uh, what's happening in the horn right now that uh, resilience investments haven't worked is an inc incorrect assumption. The shock environments become so overwhelming uh, that uh, the types of investments that have been made couldn't possibly keep up with it. So I think it's important to keep that in mind, but it only sort of doubles down on the importance of resilience measurement to explain, as Michael said, what would have happened uh, absent a shock, but what would have happened absent uh, an investment uh, that had been made? So what is the counterfactual, maybe not in terms of people preserving their well-being completely, but not backsliding uh, as far as they might have otherwise? One other point I'd make, and it came up in the chat, what are we really talking about when we're distinguishing between what's been done with resilience measurement and climate adaptation measurement? And there are some important considerations. I'm gonna post uh, to the chat uh, a consultation report uh, from the, the May meeting that we had that's been mentioned a few times uh, with University of Arizona and USAID and the Global Resilience Partnership. And really thinking about some of the additional challenges of measuring climate adaptation. As Michael said, it's not just about what's happening to current well-being, which has been the focus of resilience measurement. It's what, what's going to happen to future well-being and how do you measure that against a range of potential climate futures. Another thing that climate adaptation really brings to the fore is the, the potential for maladaptation or maladaptive behaviors, things that help people be resilient in the moment and adapt in the moment to what's happening in their lives but may actually be positioning them in a much more vulnerable state for the future. So these temporal considerations about future states, about future well-being need to be taken much more seriously, not just as a, a clever phrase that one utters, although I love it when people re-utter the phrases I utter, uh, but um, actually how do we measure that future well-being? So I think it's really interesting what Michael's laid out in terms of some possibilities to do that in sort of near term. But when we think about the time horizons for climate adaptation, it's actually much longer than that. So an example may be from Malawi, if we're um, uh, helping people uh, gain access to drought tolerant maize in areas in which you won't be able to grow drought tolerant maize within a generation, are we actually helping them be more resilient? Or are we sending them down a pathway, uh, a maladaptive pathway that makes them more, more vulnerable to a, a future climate scenario? So I think those are some of the considerations that demand that we don't simply continue to iterate on the margins of resilience measurement, but really think fundamentally differently about how we take some of these principles around measuring sources of resilience, resilience capacities, what happens to well-being over a much longer term time horizon. And that's the, the challenge I think that, that faces us all, Talika. Thanks so much. And I, I like the way that you fused and sort of brought together this thing of 
resilience or the capacity, resilience capacity is basically the explanatory variable that explains uh, the well-being outcomes and understanding resilience capacity sort of helps you on understand and pick the types of interventions that might be needed. And so in any evaluation where interventions are coming on specific capacities that are being modulated or changed, you do want to measure and understand how that happened. So that is actually very important framing in terms of the whole idea of us coming together, because if you look at some of the literature, they're sort of written out as sort of different types of approaches. Um, and uh, although the couple of things that still remain is this idea of, uh, you know, resilience as uh, a measure of coming back to an equilibrium or whether it's something that we must directly talk about in terms of falling below a certain level or a metric or a normative condition. So that'll be nice to discuss. I would like to also continue and talk about the discussion on the need for high frequency data, only because if actually we all agree, all the experts agree that that is super important, that is a pretty resource intensive need we are talking about. And does that require a collaborative approach to do that? Um, and, and certainly that means that we have to be smart about the frequency with which capacities are measured and well-being is measured, which may be quicker to do. So on that, maybe I turn to Lindsay. I, I think you, uh, we, one of the things we haven't talked about uh, is also uh, individual subjective measures. I mean, there's subjective measures have been used both to describe or sort of, you know, uh, sort of talk about shock, the severity of shocks, but also subjective measures to simply talk about, are you feeling better than you did before and so on and so forth. So I, I, I think that I understood from your work that you found some value in that in terms of being able to do things getting a good rapid assessment of what's happening because it's quick to do uh, and maybe you also did some work uh, connecting that. How does it work compared to a more complex way of getting around it? So some of your reflections on your work and then also just on everything that's been said. No, oh, thank you, Taliga, and, and thanks to Matt Maderick as well for putting this panel together. It's great to have, you know, bring, to, bring these minds together, talk about some of the challenges I think we're all struggling with in this space. Um, and to, to Mark and Michael as well for some really you know, thought provoking uh, insights with your presentation and research. I guess picking up on this issue of the subjectivity issue and, and objectivity, I guess there's maybe three points I just wanted to make and, and maybe you know, ask us all a little bit to reflect on. I think there's, you know, there's a couple of things that we still really struggle with. Uh, it goes back to kind of Mark's initial kind of slides on some of the things in terms of our sequencing from the generations, you know, from, from kind of version 1.0 of resilience measurement to 2.0 and now hopefully advancing that. I think one of the things, the things we still haven't cracked is this issue of context specificity, right? We, we often make this assumption that we can have a universal basket of indicators, you know, tie those to certain capacities and say, this is what we should be measuring to, you know, to look for coping capacities or adaptive capacities. And in many ways, you know, a lot of those are relatively uniform, right? Or we make that assumption and, you know, I think from any that when we take a theoretical stance, uh, you know, we look at the qualitative research as well. We, you know, we know, um, you know, that what makes people, uh, you know, what supports people's capacities to be able to deal with different types of shocks and stresses is very much context dependent. The things that, you know, will, will be able to help someone adapt or be able to cope with um, even a single shock or multiple shocks uh, in one area or another or different type of temporal aspects are all going to differ and they're probably likely to change as well. So, we have to recognize that weakness and, and also account for that in the methods we use. Um, I guess related to that as well is there's, a, you know, there's an epistemical, like from our epistemology of how we sort of see resilience measurement, we've also assumed that us as experts, right, we're resilience measurement experts, we will tell people what we see as the, the core indicators for resilience measurement are, and we use that as our basket, right? And, and I've done that, I know that partly because I've been involved in a lot of those processes, literally sat in rooms with people, you know, with many of the people that have been on this call and sort of said, okay, well, what is it we should measure? What's the basket of indicators that we think, you know, that, that measures adaptive capacities or resilience capacities? And we've literally listed them. Whereas, you know, from, from yeah, again, our understanding, um, you know, people have a good knowledge themselves of some of the things that do and don't make them resilient. So I guess that's some of the spur from, at least from my perspective in, in wanting to introduce, you know, some insights that, you know, subjective measurements of resilience can also offer. They can be both qualitative and quantitative. We've learned that as well from the wellbeing literature. So, you know, I, I think there's a, you know, a lot to, to kind of learn from, you know, including that perspective, asking people themselves about what they think makes them resilient, but also, you know, getting perspectives from people themselves in terms of being able to rate their own resilience to different types of shocks and stresses. Um, there's a lot of different challenges that come with that. We've, you know, the, the well-being literature has covered a lot of that too. 
but it does bring insights that I think we don't necessarily want to reject or, or throw out because they do add some compliments to some of the things that we struggle with from you know a, a traditional resilience measurement perspective. So I think that's one of the things that I really want to, to kind of highlight. The second thing is this issue about periodicity and kind of um, the need for us to be able to collect information in a relatively rapid, quick manner to be able to collect, you know, panel data and the sorts of things that we can get insights over over time. The typical kind of resilience measurement approaches tend to be quite cumbersome, right? We do big household asset uh, surveys. You know, we, we, we measure a lot of things and often doing a household uh, survey to measure resilience will take a long time. You know, it can take half an hour, an hour to do a single household. If we want to collect rapid panel data in the, you know, in the world now of big data and, and, and be able to collect measurements and lots of different things, that's probably not going to be good enough because, you know, for the data that we need to be able to, ch to check pre, you know, pre and post shock, you know, if we want large sample sizes and if we want accurate data, we need to be able to also factor in, you know, alternative ways of measuring that can account for needing to do this in a much rapid, you know, higher cycle, higher frequency. So again, I think we as a community probably need to be better at experimenting. Um, you know, I've been involved and I know others as well are using things like mobile phone surveys, um, you know, using remote surveying as well. That needs us to kind of get a little bit outside of our comfort zone too, in terms of what is it we can measure? Because in many of those approaches, we can't do a full module on, um, you know, household uh, asset measurement and other things, you know, that just don't work over the phone and take a lot longer to actually complete. So I think, you know, again, that's why, you know, as a community practice, I still think um, even though we have gone through version 1.0, where we didn't really know much, we went through marks 2.0, where we had a lot of proliferation, but I still feel like we proliferated with very, you know, with very similar objectives, very similar kind of approaches, you know, different indicators, but using the same methods. We haven't really seen very out of the box approaches to doing things that allow us to collect rapid panel data to do some of this work or to use remote surveying or to do some of these things are a little bit more experimental and kind of, yeah, move outside of our, yeah, uh, kind of traditional ways of working. So that's the second thing. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention, and I don't know if it's a bit of a tangent to some of this work, but what I'm working on right now is a kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a related, but, but slightly separate issue. I'm, I'm primarily faced with the challenge of how do I measure um, adaptation finance and what we can call adaptation or resilience financing. What can we call, say, for example, a resilience measure, a resilience building program, and therefore the amount of, you know, finance that places like the World Bank and others are dedicating to that. The reason that's so important is that financing is obviously crucial, as, as many of the big donors and funders know, you know, we want and we have committed to spending a huge amount of money on adaptation in the World Bank, you know, 50% uh, of our climate finance is going towards adaptation um, as part of our action plan. But what we call adaptation or resilience in terms of resilience building activities is a subjective thing as well, right? You know, uh, you can either put a very strict definition of what a resilience building program would be, um, and we can design specific things that kind of fit along the spectrum of very hardcore kind of adaptation uh, interventions. But there's a lot of development activities as well that support people's adaptive capacities, maybe ones that don't have climate change, you know, included at all in, in the program design or in the labeling. But they will be very crucial, if not fundamental, um, to supporting resilience and adaptive capacities, things like social protection programs, cash transfers, and others. So how do we classify those? Do we count those as resilience building programs? And do we count finance to those as part of that allocation of adaptation finance or resilience finance? So it's a slightly different question. I think it has the same methodological challenges as well, because many of these things are not binary. Um, and, and it's a thing that, you know, a, a lot of us, at least in the funding space, are struggling with at the moment that, that will dictate a lot about how we can actually support people's capacities, because what we call adaptation uh, uh, and resilience in terms of, you know, programming will dictate how much money can go to them. So I just wanted to put that out there as well as a kind of a, uh, a practical, but also slightly academic question that, that we have, um, that will have pretty big consequences for how we do some of this work. Thanks, thanks, Lindsay, for those perspectives. Really important. And the last point was kind of the way I started. By the way, if you remember, I said that you know, attracting uh, adaptation finance will require some measurements of when is it working and if not. So I think that's really important. Tim has his hand up, but I did want to go to Mo for a sec. And I, Mo, you you wrote this, co-wrote this paper with Michael. There have been a lot of reflections from everyone on the paper. So I just wanted to give you a chance to. Uh, say, uh, respond if you want, uh, and then I'll go to Tim, and I was also hoping to go back to Michael again, because I'm sure you want to add uh, some thoughts here too. So, Mo, over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, I. I, I, this great conversation, and, you know, this is the first time really we present uh, our work, and um, we 
I think there's a lot of complementarity between everything that that is being said here. I think that's a point that uh, is coming up from from multiple people. And so I, I wanted to specifically actually talk, um, sort of emphasize uh, to Hope's point that um, data measurement is is very important, right? And all these innovations in data measurement are actually some of the motivators of the the method that we are thinking of as as a way to measure resilience right so so you know free frequent high frequency data but also using perhaps satellite data to get a measure of shocks for example i think is is really important and uh will be uh critical in in sort of developing further measure, measures to uh to to measure resilience and so i'm i'm gonna uh, sort of stop at that I, I think this is a great conversation um and uh, you know i'm sort of hoping that this discussion will keep going and, and sort of bring uh, all of our uh, sort of expertise to really push this further um thank you thanks a lot more uh tim um Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Um, one of the things I just wanted to point out to, to I think several people repeat, said, said this, Lindsay was one. Um, under under a program called Real2 that we have funding from the from USAID, um, we actually are doing an inventory of all of the high frequency type survey work that's out there. And uh, that's in relationship to resilience. So, you know, some of these data collection efforts are have different functions different purposes. And so uh, there, we're hoping that there's like been 30 or 40 of these things. And so um, we're hoping to capture a lot of that uh, uh, inventive new ideas of how to use high frequency data uh, for different purposes. So once we have com completed that inventory, we will share that with everybody so that um, you guys can see what what's out there and what, what people are actually doing over. Okay, well, immediate response question to that. When is that coming out? Because we are, you know, advising Agra right now. We're talking about a high frequency approach. So did any any thoughts on the timing? Probably uh, in the next two months we'll have it done. Yeah. Okay. Michael. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so just a couple of real quick points and again in the in the hope of for you know, responding to some ideas and provoking further thought uh, by all of us. First on frequency of data collection. Um, th the biggest danger if you don't have high frequency data is if the footprint of the shock disappears quickly, right? In, in other words, if, if the shock has long lived effects, then that's one kind of world. Um, so I think we need to be careful. I mean, high frequency sounds great, um, and, you know, if something really severe happens, but then disappears in a couple of months and your survey isn't for another year, you know, you could possibly miss something. Although, again, for important things, uh, lots of us, including shock modules, typically do rely on some retrospective data. So uh, I think we, we should be mindful about, you know, when do we need high frequency data? Just, uh, you know, I'm an economist. I, I like numbers. Uh, you know, uh, so that that's great, but you know whether it's worth the expense and when it's worth the expense. I think we need to sort of keep that concept, basic kind of conceptual point in mind. Is like, what are we going to miss? What are we not going to be able to properly measure? Uh, if you know, if you the examples I was giving, I had pretty high frequency data. The model, by the way, was calibrated on bimodal bimodal rainfall patterns in Kenya, so those were six month frequencies. But if we hadn't had that. Right? How much would we lose if we did some interpolation between some of those points? Um, so anyway, I think I think we can think through those things uh, carefully. I also want to really amplify. It. I don't want there to be confusion here. I, I mean, what Mo and I have tried to suggest is, you know, let's let's measure what we mean by economic resilience, and then from there we can start to explore what the things are that shape somebody's economic resilience. So in the world of impact evaluation, I happen to be a strong proponent of different kinds of heterogeneity analysis, right? So some of my current work, and actually I presented at the May conference, 
um, was actually sort of thinking about what you might call psychological resilience and actually showing in the context of an RCT that individuals that, that had certain, uh, let's, let's call it psychological uh, weaknesses were actually not benefiting from programs at all. So we can start to, we can start if we've measured, if we've measured what we mean by resilience, then I think we can then begin to, to look in a, in a data-driven way. It's not quite the same as asking the people themselves directly, but we can, in a data-driven way, actually start to see what, uh, what shapes those things. Um, another, another quick point is, um, again, in the world of impact evaluation, some of us, myself included, are big fans of continuous treatment estimators or duration estimators. Um, and it's certainly the case that shocks are often not binary. They have an intensity that differs from place to place. They also have a duration that differs from place to place. But that's not actually all that different than a lot of things that we typically evaluate where there is some differences. So, you know, I'd give an example, when you look at uh, cash transfer programs and you're looking at the impacts on child health and well-being, you know, the, 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 the duration to the period of time and the, and the vulnerability of the time to which the child receives the treatment actually needs to be brought into the analysis and can be brought into the analysis with treatment duration estimators. And the final little thing, um, and Hope mentioned some work that we did on looking at drought tolerance seeds with insurance. And we, it, Hope, you said something very kind about the paper. Thank you very much. But, you know, one thing we did not do in that paper, that paper actually shows that people that had drought tolerant seeds received the same shock, but their immediate, their immediate sacrifice of well-being for a particular kind of shock um, you know, was much less than the control group, right? So, you know, it actually was an adaptation to an increased frequency of shock. And you, you would see it if we'd drawn the same kind of picture that I drew with most data, you'd see it is someone who had that treatment wouldn't fall as far, right, from the shock. But then the other thing we see is there are other kinds of shocks for which even that drought tolerant technology was mal or was, uh, you know, wasn't that effective. And, and then, you know, people have a very hard time recovering after those other things. So I think this kind of measurement, you know, I think it, it has the potential of seeing both, you know, are there interventions uh, or even characteristics of people which make them more robust so the, the immediate impacts of, of a given shock were less for them, but then also sort of what's the time path of recovery? And again, that can be heterogeneous. And again, making analogies to the work we all do on impact evaluation, uh, I, I, I think we, we know lots of ways to do heterogeneity analysis and, and things like that so that we can begin to really pull apart uh, what, what matters and, and, and what doesn't. So thank you. Thanks a lot. I can't believe that there, there's just five minutes left. I feel like I could go on with this group. Uh, there should definitely be a repeat convening and maybe uh, there's a way to make it happen uh, in person. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask one follow up question, which um, uh, or maybe summarize uh, some thoughts around uh, what we've agreed on uh, as a path forward. So I felt that almost the entire panel, first of all, sort of emphasize the fact that we have more uh, common ground in the way we're thinking about it. Uh, and I thought I heard a lot of emphasis on the importance of high frequency measurement and how to which we miss a lot, both in terms of dynamics, both in terms of, um, as you mentioned, the footprint of the shock, Michael, in terms of maybe missing some shocks themselves. Uh, and so the question before is, uh, what is it that we are going to include in that high frequency so that it's cost effective. Uh, and clearly there are other uh, points that were emphasized on understanding the why for which you need to understand the capacity for which we need to understand heterogeneity. Certainly information on that cannot be asked for in high frequency, which is also okay because those parameters don't change that often. Um, so it seems like we are headed towards sort of trying to describe a protocol or a framework of what goes in, you know, in the big survey, what happens at high frequency, how frequent, uh, and for what purpose, uh, as Hope, I think you mentioned, the purpose for which we use this data. So those are really exciting uh, uh, ways forward, and I, I see that we have a comment also from uh, Jen, who's who's done a very interesting paper with, uh, with uh, 
with Michael Evans, if I'm not not mistaken on on this. Um, Chris Barrett. Oh, Chris. Chris ba sorry, with Chris Barrett. Sorry, I get all all the stall words mixed up sometimes. Um, so I, we have just three minutes left, and I really appreciated the conversation. I think it is really helpful for us too. I mean, just keep in mind that Agra is going to launch a big program to improve farmer resilience across multiple countries, and we are hoping for uh, setting up a high frequency um, measurement framework for those countries, multiple contexts, multiple countries, uh, multiple uh, geographies, if it is feasible and possible. Um, any other quick reflections from anyone from the panel? I'll make one quick comment if I could and raise my hand, just, and this is following up on, I think it was Hope's comment about, are we talking about different data sources and connecting it with Michael's comment about, you know, high frequency data is labor intensive. There's an area of work that I've not gotten into, but I want to, and it goes around the, um, it's referenced as data exhaust. I don't know if anyone's heard that phrase, and data exhaust are, are available, readily available data flows um, and trying to leverage the leverage those things look, looking like um, Mpesa money transfers, remittances, and things that can send signals that are often super high frequency price data, market data, all kinds of things we can we can leverage that may give us access and may be reasonable. I mean, empirically testable. We can figure that this out. Proxy measures of some of the indicators we're trying to get to. So I think better use of avail available data flows, not just the you know, the go to things that are really valuable, like LSMS, but some of the ones we haven't yet thought of, but may give us some access to higher frequency data. Over. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I think I would call it past the data sometimes. Well, thank you so much. We are at the end of our really vibrant conversation. It was nice to hear from everyone. Thanks to each and everyone from the panel and the round table for coming for this conversation. And I hope that we can continue this conversation um, again. Thank you so much. everybody thank you everyone thank you for organizing this thank you thank you everybody thanks all bye, bye.